before we get started, I want to remind you that Tuesday coming up is the men's and women's uh, study. So if you want to come, if you've got a chance, what time does it start? 6.30. 6.30. The guy's a little bit later. If you can order up. If you can make it on out, that would be awesome to support it. I also have good news. We got our first donation from the internet. All right. Okay. Right. Okay. Online donation. We get the first one since we had it. Right. Our sister Doreen made a donation. All right. So we're Thank you, buddy. Just to let you know that when we're not here, we are doing other things behind the scene and that website and other stuffs going on. If you can support that, please do so. We need it because we're we're going far beyond these four walls. When just because we're not here don't mean we're not working for the Lord, amen? You go on that website, there's all kinds of stuff, right? The podcast, the daily walk, these are all done when we're not here. Mm -hmm. So if you can support that, please do it. Yeah. It's yeah. blessing me. If it's blessing you, yeah. support it. Yeah. Amen? Amen? There's a button up on the corner that says donate, and there's a way to get it in there if you want. If God's writing it on your heart. So how's everybody doing tonight? It's great to see everybody. Yes. Halfway yeah. point through the week on a yeah. Wednesday. Oh. It's just beautiful that we can have a Bible study. It's like, whew, we made it halfway point. Right? The world gets really heavy and uh, the devil tries to get us back out into that world system again. Boy, uh, you know, he doesn't miss a trick either. He gets into our weaknesses. He knows the chinks in our armor and he knows how to get in there. Amen. That's why it's so important to strengthen us and put on all the armor of God Amen. by actually learning his word and using it in our lives. Before we start our study, I want us to go to 1 Peter chapter 3. Good scripture up there. Something we all need to recognize. Verse. Oh, second. Did I say it? Say for us? Sorry. Second Peter <laughs> chapter 3. Thank you. That's okay. Thank you. I need a lot of it. Trust me. I know one thing for sure. If I want a lot of grace from people, I have to give a lot of grace to Amen. people. Mm -hmm. Amen? Amen? So if you want a lot, if you need grace, remember, give grace <laughs> and give mercy, just like your Lord gives grace and mercy. Amen? Amen. Amen? We need it. And we need to show it to the lost and dying world. That's why we come here, to learn how to use it and apply it to our lives. And we don't apply this to our lives, it's useless. It doesn't do anything. We become a bunch of hardened Christians that just want to suck off of God's word for the rest of their lives and have nothing to offer. Okay. But we don't want that. God didn't save us for no reason. He saved us so we can help get others saved. Amen? Amen. 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 He wants us to go to work for him now. That's what he wants us to do. Yeah. I work for Jesus. Mm -hmm. Every morning I get up, I say, all right, Lord, I'm going to work for you today. Wherever you send me. Let me act like one of your children properly. Amen. Amen. Teach me your ways through my life, Lord. Amen. And he does. Oh, yeah. Sometimes we kick and squirm, but Father knows best. Mm -hmm. He knows how to groom us. And he knows how weak we are. Mm -hmm. And he shows us how weak we are through the circumstances and people and places and things he puts in our lives. Amen? Mm -hmm. Believe me, he puts them things in our lives to change us, not them. Right. Amen. Yeah, that's why they're there. Okay, Second Peter chapter 3. Has everybody got their Bible? I hope they do, because that's your, it's your lifeline. Second Peter chapter 3. And we are going to start in verse 8. But you must not forget this one thing, dear friends. I love the scripture. A day is like a thousand years to the Lord. And a thousand years is like a day. Verse 9, the Lord isn't really being slow about his promise, as some people think. Now, God has promised us a lot of things. And listen, a day is like a thousand years. One thing, we're very impatient with God. We want more than he... He wants to grow us up spiritually, slowly, and groom us through the word of God as we grow. We want more than that often. We want more and more and more than he wants to give. Look... He'll give you more once you can act like what you, the knowledge you have and use it. Amen. Then he'll give you more once you can use what he's teaching you. Mm -hmm. Then you'll get more. You don't have to go outside to get it. Now look what it says. Look what it says. There's some people know he's being patient for your sake. He does not want anyone to be destroyed, but he wants everyone to repent. Okay? 
He wants everybody to come to him. That's why the lost and dying world has there's so many opportunities out there today to get people to Christ. That's, he's so patient. But the day is going to come when that's no longer going to be possible. Because it says it right here. Look what it says. Look at verse 10. But the day of the Lord will come as unexpectedly as a thief. One thing we are, we think that everything's going to happen. We don't think any tomorrow's going to come and everything's going to be okay. You do not know when he's coming back. There is no time to waste. If God is writing on your heart to talk to somebody about Jesus and you want someone in your family to get to heaven, you best tell them about Jesus while the day is still there. Yes. We never know when he's coming back. We take it for granted. Think, oh, there'll always be tomorrow. I can always wait. You never know. You never know. It says it right here. The day of the Lord will come as expectantly as a thief. And we know what thieves are like because we just had a couple. Yeah. Right? We didn't expect it, right? They just came and they did it, right? We came up and boom. That's how the Lord's going to come. We're not going to, when we least expect it, He's going to come back. Oh, that's a good yeah, it is, right? You don't expect it. You don't expect to get robbed. Then the heavens will pass away with the terrible noise, and the very elements themselves will, dis will disappear in fire, and the earth and everything on it will be found to deserve judgment. And it says, since everything around us is going to be destroyed like this, what does it say? What holy and godly lives you should live, looking forward to the day of God and hurrying it along. Hurrying it along. On that day, he will set the heavens on fire, and the elements will melt away in the flames. Listen, he wants us to get, get down to business. Amen. He wants us to live a godly, holy life while we're here. To be prepared for when we go to be with him. Because when he comes back, you want to hear, well done, my good faithful servant. We don't want to put our head down in shame saying, Lord, you know, I, know, I didn't expect you to come back so soon. Lord, but I'm, I'm sorry, man. I was, I was saying I'm going to get better tomorrow. This is what we do. Today is the day of salvation, the Bible says. Amen? There's no time to waste in the eternal kingdom of God. How many of us want family members to come to heaven with us? Are you telling your family members how important it is to find God? Are you showing them the importance of it by living a godly life and making an example? And let me tell you something. It doesn't matter if you like them or not. Remember Jonah? God said, go to Nineveh. I want them saved. How could you want them people saved? They slaughtered all your people. He says, no, I want you to go there and tell them about me. He says, I ain't going. Right? God swallowed. God said, all right, you're not going to go? Yes, you are. Swallowed him up, spit them out three days later. Go, I'll go, Lord. <laughs> listen, you can, listen, God's going to have his way, amen? You're better off walking with the Lord than against him. If, if God gives you an opportunity to talk to somebody about Jesus, he put that opportunity in front of you to get them to come to heaven. Whether you like them or not is not the issue. This is where spiritual growth comes in. See, the spirit doesn't have, hold a grudge. The mind does. Mm -hmm. The spirit doesn't hold grudges. It doesn't count yesterday. Can I get an amen? amen. We have to understand that. We keep score. God doesn't keep score. <laughs> that is a fact. <laughs> All right, let's get to our study now. We're going to go back in rooms. Does anybody remember where we left off? Let's see. If everybody was paying attention last week. Romans yep, we are in Romans 11. Yes. Romans 11, verse 25. Right on. If you mock your Bible, you can't miss it, right? <laughs> All right, but we're going to back up a little bit. As always, to keep the context. Let's back up to verse... Uh, 17. We're going to just come right down into this. The Bible says we're grafted into the branch, into the tree, the olive tree. But some of these branches from Abraham's tree, verse 17, some of the people of Israel have been broken off. And you Gentiles, which is us, who were branches from a wild olive tree, have been grafted in. The moment you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you're grafted into God's family. You're in the family tree forever. Thank God. Because he can't retract what he promises. Now look what it says. So now you also receive the blessing 
God has promised Abraham and his children. Now, if you read in the daily walk, you see all the promises coming to pass now mm -hmm. through the Old Testament, right? Mm -hmm. Everybody following, the people are following the daily walk. It's awesome, isn't it? Yeah, it is. It's like I'm getting into it more and more because I know other people are reading it with me now. It's like I'm like diving into it because I know I have my brothers and sisters on board with me too. It's awesome. It's an awesome responsibility. Keeps me focused. I get blessed by it. Trust me. Doing the will of God is always blessing. So now you also receive the blessing God has promised. Abraham and his children sharing in the rich nourishment from the root of God's special olive tree. But you must not brag about being grafted in. Here it is. To replace the branches that were broken off. You're just a branch, not the root. Well, you may say, those branches were broken off to make room for me. <laughs> Paul understands the human spirit so perfect. We're so prideful. It's just not funny. Look, to make room for me. Yes, but remember, those branches were broken off because they didn't believe in Christ. And you are there because you do believe. So don't think highly of yourself, but fear what could happen. For if God did not spare the original branches, he won't spare you either. Now, if you read the Old Testament of the disobedience of his children and how much of the people God slayed and burned up, remember? You're reading in it now, right? He burned up 70,000, 120,000. They all rebelled against God and fell into unbelief, and he took them out of here. Don't think falling into unbelief is not a dangerous thing while we're Christians now. Very dangerous. It says... Don't think highly of yourself, but fear what could happen. Here's what could happen. When you fall into unbelief down here, you might not be able to come to belief again. Yeah. There's no guarantee that you'll find him again. Yeah. People fall off and are broken off. They can never find God again or restore that relationship with him again. I'm like, I'm not going there. I'm staying on track. No matter how much I fall away from the Lord in my heart, I'm staying on track through his word and through my studies and with my brothers and sisters, amen? amen. Until we get back on track again. Yep. Here's where the spiritual disciplines come in that we need. Mm -hmm. Even when you don't want to be here, you're here for your brothers. Amen. I don't feel like coming. That's, that's the most spiritually immature thing to say. Because the spirit doesn't feel. Yep. The spirit does. Because yes. we do the right thing now because it's the right thing to do. Not to get rewarded for it. God rewards, it, rewards us any way he wants. It doesn't, it doesn't matter on your good or bad. Right. He rewards those who sincerely seek him, it says. Now look what it said in verse 21. Now if God did not spare the original branches, he won't spare you either. Verse 22. Look at it. Notice how God is both kind and severe. If you're reading the Old Testament with me, oh, yeah. you'll see how kind he is and how oh, severe he could be. It's such an eye-opener. I have a healthy fear of God. More and more as I read them, the Old Testament, it's like, wow. Mm. Thank God for Jesus. <laughs> yeah, the right. laws they had to follow. And if they failed at one point, they were killed. To the T. The they were cut off everything. Thank God for Jesus. I worship him even more now for what he did for me. He came to fulfill all that. So I don't have to. Unbelievable. We take it for granted, but when you read the Old Testament, you start getting a reverence for God. Yeah. So don't tell me that you shouldn't be reading your Bible. You should read your Bible from cover to cover every time, all the time and never stop. Because that's what gives you the healthy fear of God. The Old Testament will. Now look what it says. Notice how God is both kind and severe. He is severe towards those who are disobeyed, who, who disobeyed, but kind to you if you continue to trust in his kindness. You remember, their rebellious and disobedience in the Old Testament, they got cut off from God. Now look what it says. Though disobey, but kind to continue to trust in his kindness. But if you stop trusting, you will also be cut off. And if the people of Israel turn from their unbelief, they will be grafted in again. For God has the power to graft them back into the tree. You, by nature, were a branch cut from a wild olive tree. So if God was willing to do something contrary to nature, 
by grafting you into his cultivated tree, he will be far more eager to graft the original branches back into the tree where they belong. Amen? Amen. Amen. Now, here's where we left off. God's mercy is for everyone. We got God's grace, God giving us something that we don't deserve, and God's mercy is God, God not giving us something we do deserve. Amen? Amen? God's mercy is for everyone. I want to ask you a question. You say you're Christians and you're maturing. Are you showing mercy to people? Are you showing mercy to yourself? Are you showing grace? God's undeserved, fa undeserved favor and kindness, right? <coughs> are you being, uh, when somebody comes at you, are you showing them mercy or are you holding a grudge? That's how you know if you're growing spiritually. Don't tell me because you read the Bible you're growing spiritually. That's, that is the farthest thing from the truth. The devil knows the Bible. Mm -hmm. And the Pharisees knew the Bible in and out. Mm -hmm. But they didn't know Jesus. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's right. You know Jesus by walking with him. And learning his ways in your life. And showing grace and mercy. That's how you know he's operating in you. If that's not operating in you, God is not working in you. You're just one stubborn old Pharisee that just wants knowledge, knowledge, knowledge. And not, not produce any fruit from that knowledge. Amen? Amen? Knowledge is supposed to produce fruit. You want more knowledge? Produce some fruit and he'll give you some more knowledge. But everybody wants the knowledge, but don't want it to want to don't want to produce the fruit. And there's where people go off, and they start going off into other things because I want more, I want more. No, you're not going to get more till you can do more. <laughs> God's mercy is for everyone. I want you to understand this mystery, dear brothers and sisters, Greek brothers, so that you will not feel proud about yourselves. Some of the people of Israel have hard hearts. But this will last only until the full number of Gentiles come to Christ. And so all Israel will be saved, as the scriptures say. The one who rescues will come from Jerusalem, Greek from Zion. And he will turn, to, he will turn Israel away from ungodliness. And this is my covenant with them. I will take away their sins. And he's quoting Isaiah 59, verse 20 and 21. Many of the people of Israel are now enemies of the good news. And you know that right now they are. Right? They don't believe in Jesus. They're enemies of the cross. It says it right here. And this benefits us, you Gentiles. Yet they are still the people he loves because he chose their ancestors, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. For God's gift and his call can never be withdrawn. Isn't that awesome? Once you Gentiles were rebels against God... But when the people of Israel rebelled against him, God was merciful to you instead. Amen. Now they are the rebels, and God's mercy has come to you, so that they too will share. Other manuscripts say, will now share. Still others read, will someday share. In God's mercy. For God has imprisoned everyone in disobedience, so he can have mercy on everyone. Oh, how great are God's riches and wisdom and knowledge. How impossible it is for us to understand his decisions and ways. It is impossible for us. So don't try to get an understanding of his decisions and his ways. Because it's impossible to get them. For who can know the Lord's thoughts? Who knows enough to give him advice? There's, pride, there's prideful people that think that they know more than God. Yeah. In church. Mm -hmm. Listen. This book is God speaking to you directly. <laughs> this is God speaking to you directly. Why would you want to go somewhere else to hear from him? Can I get an amen for that? Amen. Stick with the word of God. You can't go wrong. Who's in those enough to give him advice? Look, Isaiah 40, 13, he's quoting. And who has given him so much that he needs to pay it back? And he's quoting Job 41, 11. For everything comes from him and exists by his power and is intended for his glory. All glory to him forever. Amen? Amen. That's an awesome scripture right there. I want us to, I want to reiterate on that a little bit. 
on, on chapter 11, verses 34 to 36, before we move on to chapter 12. Romans chapter 12 is my favorite chapter. I can't wait to drive this one in. And set, now listen, the implication of these questions that we just talked about is no one has fully understand the mind of the Lord, understood the mind of the Lord. No one has been his counselor, okay? And God owes nothing to any of one of us, okay? Isaiah and Jeremiah ask similar questions to show that we are unable to give advice to God or criticize his ways. Isaiah 40, 13 and Jeremiah 23, 18. The prophets told them, God alone is the possessor of absolute power and absolute wisdom. In, in the final analysis, analysis, all of us are absolutely dependent on God. He is the source of all things, including ourselves. He is the power that sustains and rules the world that we live in. And God works out all things to bring glory to himself. The all-powerful God deserves the praise. Amen? Amen. Look, these minds, we think that we're so smart. This, our mind is, the Bible calls us foolish if we think we're going to get him to, throw, get to know him through our minds. We can never get a full understanding of God. He's the one who created us. He knows, what, what we, he knows more than we'll ever know. And you can never find out any other way but by walking in his ways to really know how he want, what he wants from you. Can I get an amen for that? Amen. Okay. That's a fact. <laughs> That's a fact. I like that. It is a fact. <laughs> Gotta love him. <laughs> All right, let's go on to Romans 12. <laughs> All righty. Everybody ready for Romans 12? Yes. Oh, because I certainly am. I'm ready to give it to you, too. <laughs> if you really want to know how God, what God wants from you, just read Romans chapter 12. You don't have to go anywhere else. It's all right there. Everything. It tells us how to behave. See, here's, what it, here's how it works. Here's how Paul always works. He moves from the theological to the practical. That's what he does. Paul gives guidelines for living as a redeemed people in a fallen world. We ought to give ourselves to Christ as living sacrifices, obey the government, love our neighbors, and take special care of those who are weak in the faith. This is the chapters coming up. He closes with personal remarks. Throughout this section, we learn how to live our faith each day. So if you want to know how to live this out, you read Romans 12 on, and it's showing you just how. Is everybody ready now? Mm -hmm. Okay. Living sacrifice to God. Personal responsibility. Romans chapter 12. He always starts what he's done for us, and then he tells us what to do, what he's done for us. How to use it. All of Paul's epistles tell us how to do that. It goes from theological to practical all the way through. Ephesians, Galatians, Colossians, all of them go that way. At first he tells us, he always tells us what God has done for us. And then he tells us what we can do for him. Amen? Amen. So if you want to know what you can do for God today, Romans 12 is going to tell you. A living sacrifice to God. And so, verse 1, And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he has done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. How do you worship God truly? By living his ways. That's how you worship God. Not by singing hallelujah and coming to church. That's how you worship God. By living his ways. It tells us right here. I'm going to say it again. I plead with you to give your bodies to God because all he's done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. You give yourselves to God. That's how you worship him. Don't cop look at verse 2. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world. Now, what happens when you don't come to Bible study for a while? You start to copy the behaviors and the customs of this world. As a matter of fact, most of Christianity 
You can't even tell if they're Christians or not anymore because they've mixed it right into the church to keep the numbers. Instead of using church discipline and not letting sin infect the church, a little leaven leavens the whole lump. The churches are infected with sinners, and it doesn't matter. None of them are changing. None of them are growing. All they're doing is taking on money. Because when you discipline someone, there's no guarantee that they're going to come back. But it's called for the do in the Bible so we can keep the congregation clean from that. Amen. And most churches ignore it for money purposes. Amen. Oh no, they're going to stop coming and donating. Yeah. Don't worry, God will take care of us. We're going to do it His way. Now it says, don't copy the behaviors and customs of this world. Now look what it says. This is not rocket science. But let, let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. And how do you change the way you think? By learning God's word and his ways transforms us. As you read the Bible, it slowly starts transforming the way we think. But if you're not doing it, you are not changing. Don't fool yourself. Just because... You got a good job, or you got a new home, and you got good kids. Got, doesn't mean that you're changing. It's an inside change. The fruit of the spirit gets produced: love, joy, peace, goodness, kindness, self-control. That, that has nothing to do with buying a new house. It has nothing to do with buying a new car. Nothing. God does not care about that stuff. He cares about your heart. Now, then, listen. Look what it says. Then you will learn to know God's will for you. How many of us always want to ask, what's God's will for my life? Mm -hmm. Well, the only way you're going to find out is if you don't copy the behavior and customs of this world and let God transform you by reading his word. Amen. The word of God. And if you don't do that, you're not going to transform. Right. Let me tell you something. If your position does not change your condition... You have the wrong position. There's no way that your position in Christ will not change your condition down here on earth Amen. if you're truly a believer. There's no way it can't happen. It has to happen. Yes. They're not disconnected. They're connected. Your, your sanctification is connected to your position. If your position is, per, is, is right with God, your condition is going to start to change. Amen. There's just no way it won't. <laughs> And if it don't change, then your position is wrong. Yeah. Guaranteed. Everybody thinks, well, I believe. Well, you believe by showing it. Right. What you believe comes out of your life. It flows from the, the, what comes out of your heart, Jesus said. Mm -hmm. Your life shows what you believe. Amen. A lot of people are deceived by all this, by thinking of coming to church and reading the Bible, I'm saved and going to heaven. Your position with God is right, your condition's changing. You're starting to love the unlovable. You're starting to produce fruit whether you like it or not. You're starting to do the right thing even when you don't want to. Because he's transforming you from the inside out. Because your position has changed before him. Can I get an amen for that? So you have to ask yourself, if my condition's not changing, my position is wrong. You better get it right. Listen, then you'll learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. Because of the privilege and authority God has given me, which he has, believe me, I'm up here because I have, God has given me this privilege and authority. Believe me, a lot of people have a problem with authority in life. That's why they have such problems in the world. They can't respect authority. They always come up against it, thinking that they know more than the authority. Always. Any of you like that? Don't answer that. <laughs> Read the Old Testament. He came up against Moses, right? God gave him the authority, right? They came up against him. Boy, did they get chastened for that. God has given me, I give each of you this warning. Don't think you are better than you really are. I love this one. Don't think you're better than you really are. Spiritual pride is disgusting to me. And I will not let that happen in this church. 
I'll tell you right now, if you're growing as a Christian, you'll be more humble. You won't be more prideful. You'll be more willing to yield to other people and respect people around you. Can I get an amen for that? Amen. Thank you. <laughs> Don't think you're better than you really are. Be honest in your evaluation of yourself. You know when you evaluate what's going on with everybody? Stop doing that and get a mirror. And evaluate yourself. Okay? That's what you need to do. Measuring yourselves by the faith God has given you. Just as our bodies have many parts, each part has a special function. This is where Christians go off. You, God calls you to a body, there's a function for you in that body. Are you looking for that function, or are you just coming and get full and going to serve do your thing? No, when he calls you to a body, there's a special gift he's given you to function in the body he puts you in. The Bible spirit of Christ. Exactly. You don't just come, learn, and go. No, you come, learn, and grow. <laughs> And you start to say, it's not about me anymore. It's the, about the body that God has given me. And what they might need from me. That's how you know you're growing. Not what I need from them, but what I can give them back. You know when you're young, you can't do that. You have to keep feeding. But when it's time to grow up, it's time to grow up. Now look what it says. Look, so it is with Christ's body. We are many parts of one body. And guess what? The Bible says we all belong to each other. You know this family right here that we're in right now? We all belong to each other. Amen. We all look out for each other. Instead of talking about each other like churches do, we're supposed to be looking out for each other. Amen. And making sure that everybody's okay. Amen. And guess what? The example starts from me. Yeah. And I try to show that example to you. Amen. By devoting myself to God in prayer. And doing things that would help meet the needs of the people. And guess what? You're supposed to what? Paul says, follow me as I follow Christ. <laughs> now look what it says. In his grace, God has given us different gifts for doing certain things well. So if God has given you the ability to prophesy, well, you know, when you read the Bible, a revelation might come to you, and you can share that with someone. It says, speak out with as much faith God has given you. Oh, I was reading in the Old Testament about Moses. I finally learned about Gamaliel, Paul's teacher. You tell somebody about it. I've never seen that before. That's what prophecy is about. There's so much to do in the body of Christ. You should, let me tell you something. If you're bored, there's something wrong in your heart. Because Christianity is full of things to do. So much to do for God. Let me tell you something. When Jesus wanted to get with God, what did he do? Did he, go, did he go look somewhere? No, he went up to the mountains and got quiet. And he spoke with God. He didn't go anywhere but to him. Look, when you're looking for something, go to him. If you need any meaning, go to God. Don't go to the world. You won't get any answers from anybody in the world. You'll get the wrong answers. That's a deception from the devil. Exactly. Whenever you're seeking wisdom from the world... You're seeking wisdom from the devil. It's a flesh. It's a flesh. You see? He knows. It's that, that simple. People that are intellectually smart can't see the simplicity in that. They think they got to get higher now. That's what Gnosis is. That's what they were doing in the Bible. I need more knowledge. More knowledge. No, you need more fruit. You need to show some fruit from your knowledge. Hmm. In his grace, God has given us different gifts for doing certain things well. So if God has given you the ability to prophesy, speak out with as much faith God has given you. If your gift is serving others, this is another problem in the church. They think they can load everybody on a bus to do one thing. <laughs> all right, we're all going to get on a bus and go pass out tracks. <laughs> no, this is what they do. That's not what God calls us. Every one of us has a different function. It says it right in the Bible. It's up to us to find what that is. And if you're not seeking what God, your function is in the body, there's something wrong. You're not growing. Look what it says. If your gift is serving others, serve them well. If you're a teacher, teach well. If your gift is to encourage others, be encouraging. You ever get by, behind somebody that's encouraging? 
Every time you talk to him, keep going, buddy. You're doing an awesome job. Keep going forward. But not everybody has that gift. Have you not noticed? <laughs> not everybody is encouraging. You sit next to somebody sometimes and they're like, man. I ain't going next to him again. Yeah. They're discouraging, they're encouraging. All they do is tell you about their problems and not their fate. <laughs> you know that's not their gift, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> so if you need to get encouraged, right, you go by somebody who's very encouraging. You definitely, if you're discouraged, you do not want to sit next to somebody that's already discouraged. Because that, that's what happens. You get more discouraged. Mm -hmm. That's why if you have a gift to encourage others, use it. Hey, you look great today. It's great to see you. Amen. Throw out a text. Hi, how you doing? Love you. Shoot them out there. Think about other people when you're out there in the world. Think about your brothers and sisters. That's what God wants us to do. If it's giving, give generously. Now, not everybody, look, some of us give really generous, but not everybody's called to do that. So, when you, if you give generously, don't expect, because you do, that everybody should. It's a gift that God's given you. You see, people get mad about that, too, now. I give that, how come they only give? No, it's whatever put, God puts in your heart to give, you give. You give because you want to, not because you have to. And you don't have to make other people do the same thing you do. We, God does not want robots. He wants us to show love. Everyone in here has weaknesses. Can anybody in here tell me they're not weak in certain areas of their life? Some of us are strong in areas. The ones that are strong are supposed to help the ones that are weak in areas. Some people are weak. I'm weak in certain areas. If somebody's strong and I can, can get from them. I can glean off of that. But if we don't know each other, how can we get anything out of each other? This is wrong with churches. Nobody gets to know each other and know what their faults are and their flaws and their weaknesses because they're too prideful to let anybody know where they're at. So everybody, you end up with what? Miserable, discouraged Christians. Instead of joyful Christians wanting to serve the Lord and the people of God. Not mocking them, loving them. You know you're growing if you're just loving other people and you stop talking about other people. I'm so sick of hearing it. Gossip's the biggest sin in the church. That's all I hear. You hear more gossip in church than you do out there. Mm -hmm. Everybody's talking about everybody. It's sinful and it's wrong. And don't tell me that you're spiritually grown if you do it. Especially when you're not here. Now look what it says. If your gift is to encourage, be encouraging. If it's giving, give, if God has given you leadership ability, take the responsibility seriously. By the way, I take this responsibility very seriously. Very seriously. My life depends on this because I got to answer to God, not you. God called me to do this. I got to answer to Him every day. That's a fact. And if you have the gift for showing kindness to others, do it gladly. Now look, those aren't those gifts. Every you can't tell me that none of us in here has any of these gifts. Are you using them? Do it gladly. Look what it says in verse nine. Don't just pretend to love others. I love that one. You know when you tell somebody, "Love you, yeah. love you, <laughs> love you back, love you." Really? Do you love me? <laughs> Go to First Corinthians thirteen and then tell me you love me. <laughs> You get that, love you, and then go about your way. But you're mad at him, you criticize him, but you tell him you love him. That's the love he's talking about. Don't just pretend to love others, really love them, hate what is wrong, hold tightly what is good. Love each other with genuine affection. Look, people know when you're genuine, by the way. They see it by your life. When you're here, when you're not here. Whenever, you, whenever something happens, you're right there for them. They, it shows up. Look what it says. Really love them. Hate what is wrong. Hold tight what is good. Love each other with genuine affection. And take delight in honoring each other. Do you honor each other? Look, all the people in this congregation. Do you honor each other? Or do you, you know what? To each other. 
No. That's how you know you're growing. That's it. If you're complaining about, oh, I could die. Why this guy bothered me today? That's not honoring somebody. And that's the flesh. <laughs> We're supposed to come here in the spirit, not the flesh. We're supposed to leave the flesh at the door. <laughs> The Bible is serious, though. Everybody takes it as a joke. It's not a joke. This is serious stuff. That's okay. <laughs> <Damn>. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Take the responsibility seriously. Listen, look what it says. Take the light not. Never be lazy. Any lazy people in here? Work hard and serve the Lord with what? Enthusiastically. Like you want to. Not like, oh i got to go to church and do this tonight. Oh, I don't feel like it. Believe me, it shows up in your life. You can see it on your face when you come. I can see it. Trust me. Look what it says. Serve Him enthusiastically. Rejoice in our confident hope. Be patient in trouble. How many of us go through troubles? It says to be patient. How many are impatient in troubles? <laughs> This is what maturity is. Don't tell me you're mature if you're not patient. That is not maturity. You can know the Bible in and out and be the most impatient person I know. If you don't use any of it. And how do you know if you're using it? God will put somebody in your life and show you how impatient you are. You say, well, I'm a very patient person. Oh, really? Okay, here comes the test. <laughs> He's going to show you, don't think as highly of yourself as you think you are. And here comes the test. Yeah, I'm patient with people. But there's certain things, that, little things that get into me that I'm very impatient. How about you? Thank you. That's why get, patience is not something that we're born with. It is a fruit of the Spirit. And it has to be what? Developed. It's coming up. Studies coming up on patience. You know if you're growing spiritually... Not by how much of the word you know, it's how much of the word you use. That's how you know if you're growing or not. And you can't, you can't, listen, theology is one thing, putting it into practice is another. You can learn all the theology that the Bible, that everybody says about the Bible, and not grow one iota unless you put it into practice. Can I get an amen for that? Amen. amen. And people think the more knowledge they have, the more they are grown spiritually. And that is the biggest lie there is. Because the Bible says you're going to come like a child. Like a little kid. No, a little kid. Ooh. I love this. Work hard. Rejoice. Be patient. And here's the other one. Keep on praying. How many of us get discouraged and stop praying? Don't even answer that. <clears throat> When they get mad about something about God, they stop, they stop going to him. Mm -hmm. Because he's not doing something for them. Don't answer it. Just keep that to yourself. All of us do that. I know it. How do I know it? Because the Bible says it. Keep on praying. When God's people are in need, here it is right here. Be ready to help them. Let me ask you this. If I get on the phone when I left here to call any one of you, would you answer the phone? Or would you shut your phone off when you leave me and I can't get in touch with you? Are you ready to help somebody? Or do you shut your phone off and say, I'm done tonight. I can't help nobody. <laughs> Look, when God's people are in need, be ready to help them. So, if you want to know how God wants you to live, Romans 12 is right there. And if you lack any of these areas, you need to grow in them areas. Say, I'm a, you know what? I'm going to answer the phone. I'm going to be available to my brothers and sisters if there's something wrong. I want to make sure my phone is never off. Mm. Never off. Somebody texts me a call and I try to get right back to them. Mm. Because that's how I would want to get treated. Mm. Be ready to help them. Always be eager to practice hospitality. Bless. Look at verse 14. Here's a big test. Bless those that persecute you. Don't curse them. Pray that God will bless them. How's that one? 
I need to do some more growing. Right. Personally, oh, yeah. right. it's very hard to pray for someone who persecutes you. Mm -hmm. The right prayer. Not pray that they get run over. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody laughs, right? We all know it's in this heart of ours. Don't curse. The, but see, the Bible is not... See, the, this is not hard in the spirit. In the flesh, it's impossible. We just can't do it. Don't curse them. Pray that God will bless them. Be happy with those who are happy and weep with those who weep. You know, the worst thing you can do to somebody when they're having trouble is to tell them how good you're doing. It tells you to weep with them and to feel, go down and feel their, their pity. Instead of saying, oh, I'm doing so great, the Lord's breaking in my heart, and I'm getting blessed all the time. While they're, while they're sad. Or to tell them what you're doing wrong. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah, no, you go down with them and you say, you know, wow, can I pray with you? Yeah. You know, you, you start to empathize with people. It tells you. So how does God want me to live? Wow, wait a minute. Let me go outside the Bible to find out. No, it's right here, Romans chapter 12. Makes sense. Live in harmony with each other. Don't be too proud to enjoy the company of ordinary people. And here's another one. And don't think you know it all. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. I love it. <laughs> Humbling. Yes. There's people of the world that they just think they got all the answers to everything. Yeah. Well, I, uh, that's why I don't go to anybody in the world. Yeah. They think they have the answer to life. And the, look at the, their life as a mess. Mm -hmm. So, all right, I want to see. All right, you got the answer? Let me see. Let me walk with you for a day. And see what your life is like. I want to see if you have the answers to life. <laughs> I go to God when I need answers. Amen. And the Bible tells me, has all, listen, all the answers I need are right in here. Never pay back evil with more evil. You ever a Christian? It tells us to never pay back evil with more evil. How many of us pay back are still paying back? Mm -hmm. Evil. And saying you're a Christian. You really think that represents Christ right? No. No, it doesn't. Do things in such a way that everyone can see, everyone that can see that you are honorable. The right things. That's right, when you're not in church. What are you doing when you're not here? Is what shows up. Do all that you can to live in peace with everyone. Are you a peacemaker or a peace taker? Don't answer that. When you go to talk to people, do you want to keep the peace? Or are you the one that loves to stir the pot and take away people's peace? It says right here, do everything so you can live in peace with everyone. My wife will tell you, I try to stay peaceful. She'll tell you. I said, Lord, it is when she's all in an uproar, I just, I don't want to go there. I'm supposed to be a peacemaker, not a peacetaker. Mm -hmm. And let me tell you something. If you let that world into here, it'll take away your peace like that. Yep. You've got to let this fill you. The word of God. This is what fills you with peace. Knowing that this is not my home. Amen. If I think I'm going to have all the peace I want down here, I am in for a rough ride as a Christian. Mm -hmm. This is not your permanent home. We're just passing through. What are you expecting to think? Listen, it's not going to. We're not in heaven yet. I got any men for that? Mm -hmm. People put unrealistic expectations on their life, thinking I should be always at peace. You're in a world full of war. They war against the spirit down here. We're in spiritual warfare. Have you not noticed? <laughs> it's spiritual warfare we wrestle not against flesh and blood enemies but principalities and powers of the unseen world and we when we and you know what we see we take it out on people that's because we don't our spiritual eyes are not open we take it out on people when it, the devil's going see I got you you're supposed to look past the fault and see the need 
The devil is behind the person. There's something driving them. It's called Satan. The Bible says to hate the sin, not the sinner. Mm -hmm. We become Christian haters. <coughs> it says it right here. Dear friends, never take revenge. Leave that to the righteous anger of God. For the scriptures say, I will take the revenge. I will pay them back. Instead, if your enemies are hungry, feed them. You go in the flesh and try to buy your enemy a sandwich. Somebody that comes up against you. Tell them you want to take them to dinner. Yeah. Yeah, if you do, you want to take them to the worst restaurant in the world. <laughs> 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 That's a flip. Right. <laughs> uh, so here's, here's, this is to evaluate if you're a mature Christian. It says it right here. You see, that's how we all need to grow up. You see, we think we're somewhere we're not. <laughs> if they're thirsty, give them something to drink. In doing this, you'll keep burning coals of shame on their heads. Has you ever tried to do something nice when somebody's being mean to you? It stops them in their tracks. They don't know how to act. They're expecting fire with fire. When you put out the fire with kindness, they don't know what to do. But shut up. They can't process it. They can't process it. They just shut up. But you have to give, you have to put that to the test, though. You can't fire back and expect it to happen after. Once you fire back, it's on. It's over. You can't retract that. Now here it says, dear friends, let leave that to the righteous anger of God. For the scriptures say, I will take revenge. I will pay them back, says the Lord. Instead of doing that, instead of paybacks, and you know what? If your enemies are hungry, feed them. If they're thirsty, give them something to drink. In doing this, you'll heap burning coals of shame on their heads. Here it is, verse 21, the whole Bible. Don't let evil conquer you, but conquer evil by doing good. That's the whole book. That's the whole Bible. Can you do that? Can you conquer? Are you part of the problem or the solution? The solution is to conquer evil by doing good. And that's why we're here, to grow so we can do that, amen? So we can represent our Lord and Savior the right way. To the Word of God and His way, amen? All right, we just finished 12. We're going to stop there. Thank you. Brittany and Jasmine are going to come up and go out and sing, all right? Thank you.